Um, all right. So, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our 2021-2021 uh, postdoctoral seminar series this afternoon. Uh, so, if uh, you are, you know, if this is your first time attending one of our seminars, then a very warm welcome to you. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a background, you know, the seminar series is organized monthly by the Postdoctoral Association of CU Boulder. Uh, and the idea behind this seminar series is to basically provide a space for postdocs and advanced graduate students to share about their work with the wider community. Um, and so if you're interested in finding out more about our upcoming seminars or the Postdoc Association, um, you can sign up for our mailing list at you know, colorado.edu slash PAC, um, or you can also um, follow our Twitter account at PAC Boulder. Okay, so on to the topic of today's seminar. Uh, we have a panel discussion today to talk about the academic job search. So if this is, uh, you know, if you're considering about applying for a position in academia or you're currently applying for a position in academia, then I'm gonna really hope that you find this topic useful. Uh, so, you know, basic Zoom housekeeping rules. I'm gonna encourage all of you to please keep your microphones muted, except for the panelists, of course. Um, but we really want to try to encourage uh, questions and discussions. So if you have any kind of questions for our panelists, uh, please feel free to type them out using the chat function. Um, I'm sure everybody you know, is a Zoom expert these days, but if you have not used this interface before, uh, you should find the chat button uh, somewhere in the bottom of this window. Um, and if you click that, it should pop up a new panel and you can kind of type your questions in the chat. Um, you are welcome to ask questions either in the general chat, uh, but just be aware that if you do that, everybody will see the questions. Um, if you would prefer to be a little bit more private with your questions, you can just uh, send it privately to me. Um, and I will do my best to kind of monitor the chat activity and, um, you know, bring up questions to our panel. Um, and I might, you know, if a lot of people ask kind of similar questions, I might kind of group the questions up together as well. Um, and so, um, and I guess the only other thing with that, you know, is I, if you feel like I've skipped over any of your questions, uh, please feel free to post it again, just so I remember to bring it up. Um, so this is kind of like the rough agenda of topics I have for today. I thought that we would kind of start off by talking about, you know, the job application process, you know, when you would even feel ready to apply for jobs and things like that. Um, and then we can talk about interviews and chalk talks and then kind of maybe end up with negotiating on the job offer. Um, so this is just a rough plan. So, you know, feel free to ask any question at any time. Um, and if you have a question that's not, that's on a topic that's not on the agenda, that's still fine. Just, just please just ask the question in chat and we'll get to it. Okay, so without any more further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. So we have uh, Dr. Brian Aguado, uh, Dr. Esther Bresselman, and Dr. Kristen Moore. And our panelists are all former CU Polar postdocs who have managed to achieve that academic dream, you know, of landing a faculty position. <laughs> so um, I believe all of you received and you know, managed to get your position within the last year. So these are, um, so all these experiences are fresh in their minds right now. Um, and they're here today to kind of share their experiences and, you know, give us some advice, you know, for those of us who are hoping to enter academia. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, would you all mind, you know, giving us a little introduction and telling us a little bit more about yourselves? Um, I could start. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, so yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Aguado. Um, I'm currently I'm still a postdoc right now at C. Boulder, um, but I'll be starting my faculty position in the bioengineering department at UC San Diego starting July 20, 2021. And my lab will be focused on developing uh, what I'm trying to call precision biomaterials uh, to study sex differences in cardiovascular diseases. Um, and I'll pass it on to Esther so she can introduce herself. Hi, um, my name is Esther Brosman. I am also still a postdoc in the Palmer lab um, for a couple more weeks. I am going to um, open my lab in January 2021 at Georgetown University in the chemistry department. And I'm a professor, uh, going to be an assistant professor of biochemistry. I'm looking at RNA um, imaging in the context of infection. And Kristen. I'll, I'll come last. Um, I am no longer a postdoc. I am uh, <laughs> an instructor in the MCDB department at CU Boulder. Um, I have also taught high school and I've taught at a community college and I've taught at uh, Colorado College, which is a small liberal arts school. So um, for any insights into 
really any of those I am happy to uh, talk about a any level of teaching high school and above. Awesome, thank you all so much. All right, so I guess I'll start with some introductory questions. Um, I guess, you know, maybe one question I'll start off with is if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how long were you a postdoc for and, you know, when did you feel like you were ready to move on from that position and start, you know, applying for faculty positions? Um, I guess I could start again. I don't know, <laughs> since I, I keep thinking of that Go order. <laughs> um, so I felt ready. So I started my postdoc in January of 2016. So I will have completed uh, five full years of postdocing, um, and actually five and a half when I moved to San Diego. Now, a lot of that was, I feel like the first year of my postdoc was honestly a wash. Like I didn't, I was honestly trying to figure out my projects, doing uh, lots of different things. I didn't really have a steady postdoc project till I'd say my second year of my postdoc. Um, and then it took me maybe a couple of years to crank out my first author paper. And then, then that's like around year three, three and a half is when I felt like ready to go on the market um, because I had my paper, I had uh, a few grants under my belt. Um, and then it took me basically a year to land a faculty job. Like it, it like the process took me nine months. Um, and then because of COVID, I feel like it added an extra year to my postdoc. <laughs> um, so that's like, I feel like I could have started this year, but I ended up deferring because of COVID, largely because of COVID. So it added a year to my postdoc. I, I can go second. So um, I just, looked it up. I started my postdoc in 2014, a year before Brian. And uh, yeah, I took on a pretty big project that took some time to develop. And I always told myself I would look, as, look, look for a way to move out of my postdoc when the path to academia was no longer available, if that makes sense. So I kind of timed it around fellowship applications and I did end up getting the KNN application. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of um, added a timeline for me because there's a time window for when you have to um, apply and get a, 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 a faculty offer to transition. And um, just like Ryan, the um, COVID added more time. So I was ready. So I applied last fall and I was ready to start my lab in the summer, but I ended up um, negotiating with George and was ready to move, but then COVID sort of shut everything down and slowed everything down. So I ended up deferring to January. So I, and yeah, so that added, that added an extra timeline. And the NIH was really great about extending my can and then even um, for, six, for a couple of months um, because of that, because I was at the end of the funding for my postdoc. Um, oh, cool. So you got an extension for the K99? Yep, funded that's extension. Awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. Yep. I guess for me, um, I knew that I wanted to go and te into teaching when I started grad school. Um, however, at the end of grad school, I didn't, I didn't love the the projects that I, I don't know, had felt like I had expertise in, and I wanted to move into something different. So I actually used my postdoc as a way to learn new techniques and work with a new organism, which was cyanobacteria. Um, so for teaching, in general, trying to find an organism that is easy and cheap. Um, and interesting to students is, I think, kind of paramount to, to finding some of those positions. And uh, for me, I also, so like Esther said, I also kind of, I felt like I was ready to go a little bit before I went, um, but I, it was planned also around uh, the end of a fellowship. So I had an NSF fellowship for research, not for teaching. Um, and I basically was planning to, to be done at that point. Um, and so I started looking for jobs uh, probably, probably, you know, at, at the beginning of the year before that. So I, I got my Colorado college job in 2019. Um, and so in 2018, I started looking for jobs about a year ahead of time. All right. So you would kind of, so all of you kind of seem to have like about a year timeline from starting to apply to maybe wanting to move on. Right. So maybe that's the timeline that we should all be kind of looking at. Yeah. 
Yep. So that's that's, 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 I mean, all the job postings, depending a little bit on the department, on the level of the school, the jobs are posted. They start in July and really ramp up in the fall. So like right around now, I think for the hiring for the next fall. So that's the year. So basically gotcha. you apply through the end of the year. The interviews I first in in December, and that interview all through the spring. And I had my second visit um, last March, literally the week before everything shut down. And I yeah, I felt really rushed at the time, but now I'm like I'm very glad I needed that when yeah. you did. <laughs> I remember and texting each other last year. Huh? I remember texting each other being like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, like, why, why do they want me now? I can't, can we wait a week? No, we cannot. I don't think, I don't know if they knew, but I was, it was very, it was very lucky then. I ended yeah. up, yeah, sorry. All right, so I have a question for you in the chat here. Um, so the question is, where do you find faculty openings? So what kind of resources did you all look up? Um, how did you find them? So the best approach to do this um, is to find friends that are on the faculty market with you and search for jobs together. Now, the best way to do this is to, like the most successful approach for me was to just look at departments that I was most interested in applying for and see if there were positions posted. Um, I also leveraged my network quite a bit and asked if positions would be opening in departments I'd be interested in. So I had colleagues in certain departments. Um, let's say like in September when I was submitting applications but they didn't have a posting, I would just reach out and say, hey friend, is there an opening? <laughs> um, just very informally, like not to the search committee or anything, just to like a colleague that you know in the department. And they would say like, oh yeah, Brian, we should have a, a opening in December. And then I would like earmark that date and then apply in December, right? Um, but I think the biggest part of it is curating all of the openings into one Google doc. Mm -hmm. I think Chem Jobber does this for the yeah. chemistry field. I think Esther can talk more about that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't use Chem Jobber. I mostly just relied on friends in the BME field um, that were on the market with me. And we all curated jobs together and had them all on one master list. So I'd strongly recommend everyone to do that. Okay, so you actually went to like the university or the department websites and went to see if they had a job posting basically? Yep, also like society websites like BMES or Materials Research Society or whatever society you're a member of, usually there's job postings there. You could go to Nature Jobs, um, mm -hmm. AAAS, um, it's just a matter of searching, like Google, like it's tons of Googling. Academic jobs is good, um, mm -hmm. but like it helps if you already know places that you would like to be at, and then you can just like have an extra eye out for positions in those schools because usually they get posted on the department websites as well. And I can add to that. I also just looked at websites, um, but I I knew I wanted to stay in Colorado. So I had a list of Colorado schools and I literally checked them from August through August yeah. and different and, and in general, normally your positions will come up, you know, from July until maybe December ish, but every once in a while something pops up. And so um, the, the Colorado college job I got was advertised in January. The current job I'm in was advertised in March. So don't don't stop looking just because it seems like it's out of season. I think I'd recommend that. I actually randomly the job at Georgetown, a friend of mine um, told me about. I hadn't it wasn't on my radar. I think later I found it, but yeah. Actually, that, that's a good point. Uh, like, make sure to tell your obviously like your mentors that are writing your recommendation letters for you. Um, I got tons of fo like email forwards about positions as well from. Uh, from faculty that knew I was on the market and they were friendly enough to share positions if they saw them, if they came across their desk or something, you know, so. You also want to have, speaking of spreadsheets, you want to also want to have a spreadsheet that you share with whoever writes your letters so that you can check when they get sent. I mean, if they're, if they're friendly, they will like check whenever they send it so you can keep an eye off on, because some of these um, submission systems are very different. Some universities do their own thing um, so you have, sometimes you get a notification, sometimes you don't, sometimes 
they will tell you something. So basically, it's best if you have a spreadsheet with everyone who needs to submit a letter for you, and they let you know that they did it. Yep. Yeah, that's a really good tip. Keep track. Yeah. Yeah. Also, email your submitters. They've got tons of stuff going on, right? Like, make sure they know that things are due when they're due, yeah. 24 hours out. Yep. Uh, so Kristen, there's a follow-up question for you. Like, you know, is this um, kind of like the same process for looking for jobs, which is similar for high schools as well? Um, so for high schools in general, as far as I know, uh, well, and this may be different with COVID times, but generally um, people retire in either in, in December or more often in May. So there are often postings. And when I got hired as a high school teacher, I got hired in June. So it's a little bit different. It's, it's certainly not the, the long, the long time ahead of time that people are searching um, for that. However, if you are interested in high schools, make sure that you know what the requirements are for different places. Um, so just having a PhD is not necessarily enough in every district to get you hired. You may have to take education courses or education tests um, to be qualified for those positions. So look at that ahead of time. Cool. Okay. Um, so I have another question here in chat. Um, so how many publications should you have before studying this application process? I think as many as possible. Really hard to answer. There's not as many as possible. Um, uh, I mean, the, I think there's not a, like not the like best guideline. I would what I would do is I would look at recent hires in the kind of department you're interested in and see what they have done up until the point where they were hired in terms of papers, collaborations, grants, fellowships, impact, those type of things, because it can, it can um, be very different depending, like you can have one nature paper and that's enough, you can have five society papers and maybe they won't be interested. Yeah, I would, I would try to get a sense of what people who are hired in the types of places where you want to end up, what, they, what their CV looks like. So maybe with a better way of thinking about this be, you know, um, should you have basically like a project that you've just finished that you could kind of lead on to your next job kind of thing? Like, is that important to have a project to bring with you? What's that? In the perfect world, yeah, but yeah. So I, I have an anecdote. <clears throat> so I was talking to, I'd say like a big wig in our field about the same question and he said, Brian, get your papers published. Like, just, just get them published because like, he's like, sometimes when I'm on the search committee and we suddenly have a search committee meeting and I notice it in my calendar that it's the search committee meeting is tomorrow and I suddenly have to go through all these applications. The first thing I go to is looking at papers. And like I took that really to heart and I was like, yeah, it may like if I want to be competitive, I need to have the papers at least accepted. Or maybe even in, maybe in bar archive at the very least and say like submitted to nature or something, you know, like because I think that's what it's like one of the first things I look at. Yeah. Uh, what about Chris? I buy archive is good if, you, if it's not a buy archive, you shouldn't mention it. I think, like in prep without anything, I think it's not very meaningful. At a minimum, buy archive accepted is be much better, I think. Yeah, it's just the reality. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's, that's what it, it makes it difficult. But at the same time, if there's a one paper you really want out and it's not out and you feel like you're ready and you think, well, I have other things, you should still try. Right. And then, then make it like have your mentors write in their letters, yeah. like, "Hey, this person's paper isn't out yet, but it will be out, like, in a few months or something like that, right?" Um, and I expect it to be published in this high impact journal or something like that. I think it's, it's I think it's better for your mentor to say that than for you and your CV to say something to nature. That's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think for the the more the small liberal arts and the the teaching positions, I think it's often research is often thought of as for applicants as secondary, and I don't think in the actual application process that it is. So oftentimes, 
I don't think having the huge numbers of papers or the super big papers is quite as important, but having evidence of publishing is still important for small liberal arts colleges. They, a lot of them are still looking for that to happen. Um, so maybe the bar is slightly lower, but I think the expectation is that you will have done research and you will be publishing that research and that you will have a project that you're gonna bring with you that undergrads can contribute to. Because you will be applying for grants as well, right? Yep, a lot of them, a lot of times. It depends on the department. Um, at, at Colorado College, you were encouraged to apply for grants, but you did not have to. Um, at other places that have maybe less of an endowment, that's how you get your research funded. Cool, okay. So I'm also kind of wondering, like, you know, it feels like y'all applying to a lot of places, but how many positions, you know, did you apply to? Did you kind of apply to every ad that came up uh, or were you try to, were you more selective in like the kind of schools that you were looking for? Um, so I got the advice that, so I, I, I got wide ranging advice, but I got some advice from one of my mentors and she told me, um, try to apply to as many places as possible because ultimately this ends up being more of a PR stunt than anything. You want to put your name out there and the kind of science that you are doing. Um, and getting as many interviews as possible was highly beneficial for me because like this is really the one time in your career where like if you get lots of interviews you can go on lots of different visits to different departments and meet all of your colleagues, right? And even if that doesn't end up into a job, these are all going to be professors that are going to be future tenure letter writers and these kind of things, you know? So like, I didn't realize the power of that um, because I was, I, I was initially going to be more selective and say, I wanted to just apply to like a few but I was encouraged to apply to as many as I can so I can try to improve the chances of getting as many interviews as I can for this specific reason. And I thought that that was hugely beneficial. Um, but then I ended up still, like you can't apply everywhere. Um, there's some ridiculous people on, uh, on future PI Slack that apply to like hundreds of jobs and that's just not realistic. <laughs> like you have letter writers that are gonna be submitting hundreds of letters. Like I don't see how that's possible. So you want to also respect the time of your letter writers too. Um, but so I applied to, I, I basically just focused on bioengineering. Like I thought that that was the department where I could teach the most classes. Um, I think it matters a little less, at least in the engineering disciplines or at, like in biosciences and stuff. I think it matters less what department you're in, just as long as you have good colleagues that you can collaborate with. But um, it's really like, what classes can you teach? So that kind of, helped me focus on bioengineering as my home department that I would be applying to. So that reduced the space of applications that I would apply to. So um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have comments. I, I also got the advice to apply broadly because if you, I think some people have this idea, oh, I'm just gonna try it out this, this season. I'm gonna try again next year. Next year, I'm gonna do it for real. But like, if you do it, you should might as well do it with all, like, with as many applications as you can. Because the last thing you want is to have a year where you say, I'm just going to try it out and then you get an offer that feels okay, but maybe not as perfect as you had hoped. So what then, <laughs> right? <laughs> is it going to be there next year? Also, <laughs> also consider geography too. I mean, I, I was not about to apply to schools in the middle of Ohio. Sorry if anyone lives in Ohio, but like, it's just some place that I just don't ever envision myself living in. So I just decided to just not apply because it's also, you don't want to take the search committee's time if you're really just not serious about going somewhere. Um, so that I think geography helps a lot in narrowing down. I basically took like the United States and drew it a line and looked south because <laughs> I didn't want any winter. <laughs> so like, that's one way to focus, right? Um, it's just, you just have to be honest with yourself and your needs. Yeah, I focus on areas where uh, the true body problem can be solved. So places with lots of opportunities. I also want to chime in. So I, I 
only looked in Colorado, but that meant that I was applying for things that were maybe a little bit of a reach for me on some things. I also got the advice to apply to everything and I knew that I didn't want to be anywhere else. Um, but that being said, for me, I think the benefit was yes, in, in getting some of those additional interviews and that type of thing, but it was actually more for practicing and updating my, my statements and um, my, especially things like the, the research statement, the diversity statement, the teaching statement. When I look at my first drafts of those, like, oh, they're terrible. Um, every time I applied, like I, I re-looked at them, I was like, Ooh, oh, let's change that, let's change that. And so by the time that I, you know, was actually getting jobs, I felt they, they, I felt like they were much better. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think some of that is just practice. And so doing it with a purpose, right? Not, like I said, not just, oh, I'll, 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 I'll throw my, my hat into the ring and not really try. Like, no, no, it, if you're gonna do it, do it. And yes, absolutely. The feedback that you get. Like sink your teeth in for real. Like I, I've never understood the logic of like sampling the waters and seeing how you do. Mm -hmm. because it takes so much time to prepare these documents. It's like the return on investment if you spend all that time and then just apply to a few schools, like it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like if you're gonna do it, just like do it for real um, and try to land the best position that you can with the best foot forward that you have, right? Mm -hmm. And there's like actually who would pay by discussion. There's a paper that's in the archive and you think I need to try it now and I can't like yeah you're just gonna try it and see what happens if that's the area you want you want to try Okay, so since we started talking about all these different statements right so I don't know if, if you haven't started this job search process yet then you know just be aware that you basically are writing a million statements right you have to write your research statement, your teaching statement now everybody's looking for diversity statements. So I'm kind of curious to know, um, you know, how much did y'all tailor these different statements to the school? Like, how much of it did you keep the same? And how much did you, like, you know, do you have to write a new statement each time? Or what did you do? Um, my strategy was to, at least for the research statement, I, I felt like, like 90% of the document was the same. And I strategically left, like, the last half paragraph and called it institutional opportunities. And then that would be the paragraph I would customize, right? Um, and that would be true for all of my statements. Like I would have, like on my research statement, the institutional opportunities would be like funding opportunities and collaborators and institutes I would want to work in and these kind of things. Uh, for my teaching statement, it would be, these are the classes I'm interested in teaching. And these are the classes I would propose teaching uh, or designing for your department. And then for the for the diversity statement, it would say, I would love to synergize with these active uh, DEI initiatives on your campus. Um, and this is how my previous experience would connect with that, right? So all of your statements are customized to some degree. You also have the cover letter. And the cover letter, yep. The only one that's not customized is your CV. <laughs> yeah. That was the same for everybody. For me, I did customize my CV depending on what I was applying for because some of my positions leaned more research or more teaching. Um, so I would, I kept the same information for the most part, but I did flip flop things around and I prioritized things. So if, if, if that's you and you're kind of looking at a diverse set of jobs, not just fully research or fully teaching, you may end up customizing that as well. Because so on the topic of- I'm sorry, because like, I think for- teaching intensive institution, you want to put the teaching experience first, right? And the papers and research mm -hmm. data. Yeah, it depends on the institutions you're applying to, right? Gotcha. So actually on the topic of teaching, um, so I have a question here in the chat. Um, so postdocs don't normally get, you know, much kind of teaching experience. Like most of the time uh, you might do maybe a TA doing your PhD or something like that. So how important is it to find, you know, teaching opportunities and experiences, um, especially if you're gonna look for maybe instructor type positions? Um, what, what do you think? Sorry. It, unfortunately, I agree the standard postdoc and standard PhDs are not set up to give you teaching opportunities, um, which means that you probably need to go out of your way to make those. So work, try to, try to 
overburden yourself further and adjunct at a community college. Um, during my postdoc, I set up an outreach program with high school students. Uh, find, find ways to be the instructor of record, especially for, especially for a lot of the instructor positions. The, one of the requirements is that you submit your, your syllabi from classes you've taught and evaluations from your students. So if you are not the instructor of record, you, you don't have those to submit. Um, so I was kind of surprised by that when I was looking at some of the positions I was looking at is that they were asking me for these things. And I was like, well, I've only, I've only really taught one class. Here you go. Um, so finding those things also, um, depending on how long you want to put off trying to find a real job, uh, finding visiting professor positions. That's what I did at Colorado College. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes at small liberal arts schools, when people go on sabbatical, they, they need somebody to cover those classes and it can't just be picked up. There, there aren't TAs or postdocs to, to cover those. So oftentimes there will be one year or two year visiting positions and it, those can depend a lot on the institution for whether they treat you like a professor or whether they treat you like an adjunct. Um, but either way, you will get experience and you get tossed into the fire. And I, I just say you gotta, you gotta find ways to get that experience if you want one of those positions. Yeah, so I found you can write a teaching statement with lots of mentoring experience and not much yeah. actual teaching, which you can do and that's the experience you have and that's what is acceptable. And I have I never, had, um, a, I don't think it was a problem for me that most of my experience was mentoring. And even on your visits, they will talk about expectations for tenure and teaching. And but what, what I was told even during visits was that they view your research talk as a teaching opportunity. So they, mm -hmm. you, you need to make sure that the students, the undergrads, grad students can follow you and you're engaging. And someone actually told me like, you have good energy during your talk. It'll be fine, teaching will be fine. <laughs> so <laughs> that's sort of how I want schools view this and they told me well like there needs to be an upward trajectory for tenure like you need to teach and it needs to be improving generally speaking and that's that's the expectation yep yeah is that what you heard brian yeah i don't have much to add uh i had my advisor she she would invite me to guest lecture for some classes so that would be additional experience um i developed science communication uh workshops for undergrads so like if you find a niche of research or like some transferable skill you want to teach or these kind of things, like it doesn't have to be necessarily science. It could be like teaching or transferable skills to students or doing uh, doing fun things like that. Um, so that also builds your teaching experience. I've also, uh, I didn't personally do this, but I know some candidates that did teaching certificates um, yeah. either through their PhD program or like even during their postdoc. Um, I think CU Boulder has a teaching certificate, but I think it's only for grad students. I've looked into this and I, like, I think I could have participated. It was just, it was logistically hard. I don't know. I, I didn't, I, I gave up easily, but I encourage everyone to at least like look into it and see if you can make it work for yourself. But, um, but again, like if you're doing R1, like, I think what the advice I've received is like, just don't write a bad teaching statement. Like, <laughs> like, even if you don't have all this amazing teaching experience like you probably have experience mentoring those kind of things like you probably have guests you have experience as a ta like that's enough for an r1 position and I, like i took like an audited course in pedagogy so you talk about backwards design with some like you know what you're talking about when you write that paragraph yeah and that i think what is sufficient for r1 sure i mean read up on it like don't yeah, don't yeah. just like yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Another option for getting some of that, I mean, maybe low bar uh, teaching type of experience at CU Boulder, it, there's a CU Science Discovery Program, which often hmm. looks for yes. labs to host uh, CU oh, yeah. So, um, So we did that, I did that. And they also have summer teaching opportunities, some of which are like the curriculum is designed. So you, it's two weeks out of your summer, you do get paid for it. And, and you, you teach. And so, no, you aren't getting like evaluations, but at least you can then say, I've, I've taught a summer course or something like that. So that's a program to look into if you're maybe not ready to take on a, a full adjunct position or something like that. Yep. 
So, okay, so that's teaching. How about diversity statements, right? Like, what do you all think, you know, how, how would people try to increase their participation in this kind of DEI, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion activities? Because I think that that's now becoming a really, really big topic and a lot of focus, I think, in university, especially this year that I've seen. So I'm going to let Brian talk about this more. But what I was told is most, like, probably most professors who are on the search committee don't really care about this statement. It should just need to be there. But the people who care, they will read it really carefully. So it needs to be good. That's sort of what I was told. So you have to have something of substance because the people who care will look at, look at it closely. And you might be, they might be in a position of making decisions or not. You can never know. What do you think, Brian? Um, so, I so so the diversity statement. I think that the 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 way you have to go about it is to at least start the statement with like a half a page about your story <clears throat> and why, like, what diversity means to you. Um, I think it's very. It needs to be personal. Mm -hmm. You can't just start off your statement saying something, some broad statement like STEM has a diversity problem or like I support Black Lives Matter or like that, those are all good things, but it needs to come from you. Like, like you, like I always tell this to people, like you can't write a paragraph and write your name above it and then take, erase your name and write somebody else's and have it sound like somebody else wrote it too. You know, like it needs to be why is this, why, is it, why are these issues important to you? And what have you done in your life to be an ally for these causes? Um, I think that that sets the tone for the rest of your essay, which then you can start talking about your mentoring experiences by mentoring underrepresented populations, um, any outreach that you've done, um, things that you might be interested in doing as a faculty member, these kinds of things, right? But I think it's your opportunity to showcase why you care about these issues. And you're not just going to be someone that says that DEI is nice, but I don't really care about it because I care more about my research. Like you actually have to. <laughs> Go ahead, Kristen. I was going to say, I want to second what you said earlier about looking at what initiatives each mm -hmm. place has. Um, so, you know, even if, even if you don't have a ton of experience, looking at how you could contribute to those and also thinking beyond the race box to be perfectly honest a lot of schools are interested in diversity as far as yes gender and and race but also disability levels and those types of things so not not just like uh, I, I i've you know I, i've mentored certain types of students no think think beyond kind of what we maybe traditionally think of as diverse mm -hmm. So do you all know of any, um, I guess, CU Boulder opportunities here to be able to participate in some of these things? So I heavily participated in the SMART program. Um, the SMART program was a really nice mentoring opportunity to mentor underrepresented students for the summer. It was like a summer RAU program. Um, I did a bunch of my own personal initiatives. I like I co-founded Latinx and BME. I, started my career at CU Cafe. Um, I did a lot of work for them. Um, it, CU Cafe is wonderful. Um, what what yeah. is CU Cafe? So CU Cafe, um, it is a training organization where we, at least this is how it started, um, we would invite underrepresented faculty to bring, uh, to, for them to come and give both uh, academic and career building talk but we would also have funds to bring some of their trainees with the idea that their underrepresented trainee would be interested in attending Boulder for graduate school or postdoc or something like that, right? So it was kind of this nice idea of bringing both faculty and trainee to give talks and these kind of things. So uh, it was a lot of work <laughs> like planning these things. So, I mean, it, it was so fun though. Like I love doing it. Um, but I, I only ended up doing it for like maybe a year, year and a half until I started sinking my teeth into Latinx and BME stuff. Um, but yeah, CU Cafe is wonderful. Uh, I suggest uh, folks join that organization because they are doing some really fabulous things. 
All right. Um, okay. So moving on a little bit. Um, so I've heard this advice that, you know, sending out follow-up emails after you've submitted a job application. Um, so maybe sending out emails to maybe the hiring committee or faculty members could be a useful strategy. I don't know if any of you tried this and if you did, do you think it made any difference? I've tried, I've tried it for places where I knew I was interested and other opportunities were happening and I wanted to get a sense of what the status was, but I'm not sure if it, like sending an email to someone, I don't think that leads them to like up your application, if that makes sense. I don't think it would make a difference. I know like the future, future BI Slack has a spreadsheet where people log whatever happens at the four different searches. So you can see, okay, they're interviewing people and I wasn't contacted, so probably I'm not going to interview. So that's helpful. Um, I don't know what you think, Brian. I'm not I'm sure if you can email your way into a job interview. My, <laughs> I don't think you can email your, your way to the job interview. I do think that there is something to be said about emailing your friends in the department. Um, like this is why it's so important to network. Like everybody in this room like needs to network um, with like I started networking in graduate school. And what was nice is that my network that I built over years when I would network as a graduate student with a postdoc or a faculty member. Now that I'm a postdoc applying for faculty positions, the both folks are now suddenly chairing search committees and they're department chairs, right? So I think it was hugely beneficial for me to start like early on to build that network throughout time. Um, because by then I feel like people on the search, like if I knew somebody, like it was already a friend I've known for years, it wasn't weird if I emailed and said, hey, I submitted my application. And then they'd be like, flagged it <laughs> or something like informal, you know? So it's like, I think that works. Um, I, ca I can't say if by flagging it, it ended up leading to an interview, but <laughs> I'm sure it did something, right? I think there may also be benefit to uh, emailing after an interview, after you, you've oh, had yeah. that contact. And also if you don't know the people in the department, but maybe your PI does, or one of your other letter writers, um, that, that might carry a little bit more weight than you yourself emailing. So I, I, I know that I had a PI that, that reached out for the job that I currently have. You yep. know, whether that made a difference, I don't know, but I know that that happened. Yep. Cool. Uh, thank you all for that. So um, I think I'm just going to move on a little bit from job applications to maybe, um, oh, sorry, actually, so there's one, one more question here that I'll ask before we move on. Uh, so I have a question in chat here that says that, you know, most postdoc positions only have funds for one to two years. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to find opportunities for external funding during your postdoc? So it seems like I think most of you had grants, I think, during your postdoc years. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I, th I think it's easier for folks in biosciences because there's already like postdoc awards that your lab probably has already applied to, right? So former postdocs in your lab like the, like the F32 is a common mechanism, the NIH F32, um, the American Heart Association postdoc award, um, Burroughs Welcome Fund postdoctoral awards. So like there's a ton. So I know that Johns Hopkins, so Dennis Wirtz, I believe, he's on Twitter also, and he curates um, all the postdoc fellowships like from around the country. It's like a curated list of like 300 postdoc opportunities. Um, so I remember looking through that list and kind of finding unconventional postdoc uh, fellowships to apply to, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's all sorts of postdocs out there. It's just a matter of like finding them or postdoc fellowships, right? So it's just a matter of finding them. Boulder has one um, as well for postdoc fellowships. Um, the Maybe they made it clear. The, the directions were not super clear when I was postdoc, but um, like I, I know people who were awarded that, and it was supposed to be one of these kind of uh, types of transitional things. So it would be after you've maybe used up those one to two years of funding. And as far as I know, it was not subject specific. I think it was available to anybody. 
Oh, that's good to know. I, I didn't actually know that. I'm going to chat to everybody the resource I was talking about. I think he does this for junior faculty too, if I thought correctly. All right, cool. So, um, so maybe let's move on from just the application now and let's just assume that, you know, some, some of the applications have been successful and now hopefully you're moving on to the next step. Um, could y'all tell us, you know, what is basically the next step, which is the, I guess, the interview process? Like, how does that work? So, so like phases, oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead, Esther, go ahead. It, it depends on the department. Every department does it kind of differently. Some just come up with a short list and invite people out. That's a bit of pre-COVID, which is usually five to six candidates. Um, some do phone interviews first with like 10 to 12 and then make a short list from there. Some, so my, where I ended up now, they did, they invited me for an in-person interview and they said, actually we need a phone interview too for first, which I don't know what that was about. Some do Zoom, some have word slides, some just chat over the phone. It's very, um, it really depends on the department. So basically you want to be ready for a phone interview and then obviously the in-person interview, yeah. Some in-person interviews, I had a symposium style where you would interview with six other candidates on the same day. Um, so those sound intimidating at first, but they're actually, I, that was like my favorite interview because you get to talk to the other candidates and it ends up like being really fun. You end up being friends with them and like they could be potential future colleagues, right? So um, it was a really great networking experience actually. Um, the but yeah most of the visits were like like esther said like phone interview then um sometimes i would bypass the so okay one strategy is that if you attend conferences um like the bmes society has a meet the faculty poster session and if you have like nice positive interactions with some faculty in those uh in those like events geared towards connecting search chairs with uh, candidates if you have a good interaction, you might sometimes bypass that phone interview stage. Um, or some don't have phone interviews for some, or maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I bypass them, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. Like I know that for, so for one of the institutions, I got a direct onsite where some were screened for the phone first, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. I, I think departments just do it differently. Yeah. For teaching, it's kind of all over the board a little bit. So you may be asked to give a very similar type of talk um, and have a similar experience, I think, as a, an R1 um, interview, where you give a, a seminar to the undergrads. Other places ask for actual, like, you're going to teach a fake lesson. Here's the topic. Um, for this position that I got, I had a, it was during COVID that I, I picked up this position, and I had a 30-minute a interview, and that was that was it with members of the, the hiring committee. So yeah, my, my experience ranged the entire gamut of full day, we're going to take you out to dinner and you're going to give a seminar and spend the night type of thing to here's a 30 minute interview and we're going to, we're going to hire you. Uh, so teaching, it can be across the board. One thing that I would say, if you are thinking about doing something non-standard for your research, uh, maybe teaching type of presentation to faculty or students, make sure you practice it ahead of time and that you know your technology will work. A lot of teaching um, presentations fall apart when uh, Schoology doesn't work or, you know, what normally shows up on your screen is showing up on your second screen and it's, you know, it's, it's not right. So make sure that any of those kind of tech applications you're going to use and you're going to ask people to, you know, put things in with their cell phone, that those are robust, I would say. And, and you want to be ready. So I have my own bipod markers. I have my own um, uh, USB, uh, um, laser pointer, all of that. You want to have everything pretend like they have nothing and you want to ask them before especially for the for the research seminar you want to find out who the audience is if they are never what departments what level because like i said especially for our one schools this is the way to show that you can teach and you can be engaging with the students yeah yep uh, that's a really good piece of advice so you would actually change yeah, you would tailor the level of the talk i guess based on the audience for that day yeah, but i had one more especially for a chemistry heavy department, I would have a section, yeah, yeah, a little bit, not, not like grammatically, but yeah. 
like some advice that I've heard is like you want one third to be so like in your department seminar, you want one third of the talk to be like accessible to everybody, like even the public, right? Like you want it to be, you want everyone to be able to understand what you're talking about. Then one third may be specific to people in your field. Uh, like, it, it, sorry, one, one third specific to people in your department. Like, so in my case, like I, if I'm talking bioengineering, like any bioengineer would be able to understand. And then one third would be like field specific. So people in biomaterials would understand what I'm talking about, right? Like, so you wanna make sure that you are showcasing technical expertise, but it's also your ability to communicate your science and have everybody understand what you're talking about. And it's become, it becomes a real art form where your technical like points that you're making on slides, if you can always bring it back to like a general audience and say, like you explain details of your experiment, but then bring it back and say, this experiment is important because X, Y, Z, then it's like helps your audience stay with you. And like, you want to hold their hand through the whole time. And then also, I mean, this cool. is yeah, I, I noticed depending on the type of audience, I would get the same questions. <laughs> Oh, you would hopefully you should know by now or by then by the time you get on interviews and you can be a little strategic about what things you don't mention you kind of allude to yep. I, I'm like this these two slides that always come up and I'm like well, this is a great question Look, that's I have this I'm prepared <laughs> yeah. so yeah. You, that, that's a way to like moderate the Q&A too and be yeah, to, to really do that do good, good job then the other thing I was told is like any talk you give coming up to your um, faculty interview or even during interviews, every question you get, you wanna like make a note so that you can remember like if the question comes again, how you can, how you can address it. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious to know as well, do you all have to give a chalk talk? I think that maybe this is maybe the more mysterious part of the whole interview process. Um, so if you did give a chalk talk, could you briefly kind of explain, you know, what it is and what you did for it? Um, the chalk talk was a huge source of anxiety for me. Um, and then it ended up being not that bad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always like, it, it's like whenever we're par preparing for quals, there's like this huge level of stress. And then when you prep and get there, then you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Right. Like there was one chalk talk that was like that. There was one chalk that was intense. Um, but I handled my own. Right. Like, but anyway, um, the chalk talk it's really your opportunity to summarize the most exciting aspects of your research statement. So you always want to start off your talk by maybe like a quick recap of like your field that you're interested in, like what you want to do for your lab, right? And then quickly, because there's some people that might not have gone to your department seminar. Sometimes the chalk talk is before the seminar. So you have to like rearrange how you present yourself um like so content wise you really just want to focus on well, this is what i want to do for my lab like it's kind of like this pitch of like this is what i want to do then this is why i'm the person to do it so i have experience for my phd and my postdoc that can enable me to do this and then here's a nice overview slide of what my lab is going to do so you really want to like develop a nice figure that showcases like your two to three projects that you want to do as within the first five to six years that you're evaluated for tenure, right? Like that's kind of the scope. Um, you don't want to do a chalk talk for your 30 year long career. That's not the goal. Um, you also don't want to do a chalk talk for the first year of your faculty, right? Like it's more of like, what's your vision for you to get tenure and what do you want to be known for? Um, and that takes a lot of time to develop like really, like I, I've gotten this advice well, like if you don't have a one slide summary of what your lab will be or what you wanna do as faculty, you're not ready for the market. Like that one slide that you show in your talk talk is like absolutely critical and needs to like clearly convey the mission statement of your lab and what, how, and how your projects connect to that mission statement, right? And then the subsequent slides will be focused on like the broad impact of your project, like what your hypotheses are. Here are some 
like overview of the methods that I want to use, expected results, and the broad impact of the work, right? Um, and then just kind of be systematic through that. And then you'll get interrupted with questions and stuff. But I think like the most important thing that you should convey is that mission statement of what you want your lab to be. Brian, did you ever have to actually like whiteboard it up or did you always have slides available? I had to whiteboard it up as well. Um, and actually during COVID times, like I talked with my search committee and I actually drew out on a tablet, like the drawings that like, Actually, so I'll, like while somebody else talks, I can pull up some examples. Um, I'd be happy to show some examples. Um, so it, it, uh, what I was going to say is it depends on the department in school. Some are very strict and say no slides, no nothing, no preparation time. Here are markers. Here's a whiteboard, go. Some say you can have slides. Mm -hmm. it, that's something you want to find out beforehand as well. Yeah. So that's again why I brought my five different colored um, whiteboard markers with me wherever, wherever I went, just so that I can practice and have the different colors going. The thing that the common questions, I think, to prepare for are things like, who would do these essays? And you could say, okay, this is something an undergrad could do. This is something I would need a postdoc for. These are the types of um, instruments I would need. And this, this is something that facility XYZ could help with. Like those are the kind of things to prepare for, especially for um, each university where you go to. Where you go to, so you don't want to propose something where you're not aware that you need like this expensive microscope that you haven't thought of, and you don't think this undergrad heavy institution would provide the environment to do the experiments, for example. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You want you want to think of your first project, your first paper, your first grant. Those are the types of questions you get. Yeah. And I think. Um, I never had to do a chalk talk, but those are the similar types of questions that I got through interviews is, is, is this feasible with undergrads and with what we have available at our institution? Because you normally won't have the fancy microscope or the EM facility or that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. making sure that you're not proposing mouse studies at mm -hmm. uh, mostly liberal arts school, they're probably not going to go for that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to share an example if like we want to do that. Just yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I do want to be clear. So I'm showing this as an example, but every chalk talk is different. Like, like you have to realize that the chalk talk is your opportunity to show how you are as a researcher, like how you think, right? And if the best way for you to convey that is just by talking without drawing, or like if you're like you have to develop a strategy that makes sense for you and how you want to best present yourself. I think that's like what I ultimately ended up figuring out from this. It's like, there's no uh, like rule for what you do in a chalk talk, talk. It's more just like you selling yourself as a researcher, right? And the other thing too is you, would, you should not view this as a way to like pitch, an, pitch like a hypothetical idea. You should get in the mindset of this is what I will do at this school. I really think that way. So like, what, yeah. how many students do I need? Would it be possible to do this with like one or two grad students a year, which is, is that feasible with the department that I am applying for? Like those types of questions. You really wanna pretend like this is actually going to happen. That kind of helped help me to get the mindset of doing this. Exactly. So like, for, so for example, my chalk talk, I would start off by saying something about precision biomaterials, for example, and like why I wanna get into this field then zero in on, I want to study sex differences in cardiovascular disease and why it's important. And then zero in once again on aortic valve stenosis and cardiac remodeling. So you can picture like, like I'm, I'm doing this as a, like a virtual chalk talk, right? But if you guys end up doing chalk talks in person, you would be writing this out on the board, like why you talk, right? Um, so then, like my lab will operate at multiple different length scales from the molecular scale to the tissue and organ scale. And my focus will be first on studying aortic valve stenosis and chromosome extracellular and, extra, cellular and extracellular, right? And then these are how simple the drawings need to be. Like I have a valvular interstitial cell, so cells cultured on a soft hydrogel. And then I have a myofibroblast cultured on a stiff hydrogel. And this one happens to be a female myofibroblast. Whereas male myofibroblasts might culture like an osteoblast-like lineage, right? So you have like the soft material and the stiff material. 
And then like for the here, I did ask like if it was okay to show some data. Um, but then like my first aim, I said, here's my tool. And then I kind of go through and like, like end up talking about like what that first aim might look like, right? And then the second aim, like my tool that I want to develop is here. And then you have your simple drawings and then you kind of walk your audience through those, uh, through those steps, right? And it, like, again, if you're drawing as part of the chalk talk then you're like drawing it on the board. And then your third aim could be like something like this, right? Um, and then that's it. Like you just have drawings and then it's, it's just like, at that point it ends up being just a conversation, right? So the board is usually just a tool to guide your search committee through the projects that you want to do, but it a good chalk talk enables that conversation between you and your and your committee. The other thing that I try to do is to be to have an answer to how I would fund these different aims. So you want to yeah. be you want to really think through, okay, this could be something that I could apply to NSF, this could be an hour one, this could be smaller grant, this could be miles zero zero, like those type of questions. So like, like again, you wanna, you wanna, you, you're pretending this is, you're gonna get this job and how would you actually do this? I think the goal is they don't want to hire someone who they can't give tenure, basically is, is the goal for them. Yeah. As a quick logistical note, sometimes, especially for people who have presented with slides forever, you know, you're not supposed to sit there and face your slide. Don't talk to your chalkboard. Um, right. either because you're a lot quieter when you're facing away from your audience. So make practice ahead of time and find the ways to draw and then face the audience and then draw, you know, it, I think it takes a little bit of practice mm -hmm. to do that. It's so. so important to practice. Like I, like before my first chalk talk, I got Esther and a few other postdocs and some junior faculty to come to my talk and it was a disaster. Like I was just like, I thought it was like, <laughs> but then like you practice, you practice, you practice, and then it ends up being fine for its showtime, right? So. Yeah, Brian, I have to say your drawings are very pretty. <laughs> I think I'm gonna need to practice a lot. I don't think I could draw a cell like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's important to show, like, I thought it was important to show an example of what a drawing could look like. It's, they're like not detailed, you know, like it should be something that a child could be able to draw and understand, right? So, yeah. No, that was very helpful, thanks. Um, so actually I have a question in, my, in chat here about this department seminar. So when you're uh, giving the seminars at an interview, um, how much uh, you know, do people typically incorporate like their grad work versus their postdoc work in these seminars? I did not, I did like one or two slides of my grad work. I think it really depends on your, um, your, like your aims and what you're proposing to do if, if you are, Independent independent research combines both. Then sure, talk about both. But if it's mostly an extension of your postdoc, I mean, you, you want to showcase, yeah, you, you want to showcase. Yes, I've done things in my grad work. But the first committee has read your application and knows about your grad work. And if the story that you want to tell is better to tell through just your postdoc work, that's fine. I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Brian? I like. I agree with what you said, Esther. Like, I think that, so, hmm. I think it's, 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 I think it's focusing mostly on your postdoc and postdoc work is most important. Um, like, I, I, like for the department seminar, I focus mostly, I'd say like 10 minutes on the grad work I'd say like 25 minutes on my postdoc work and then like another 10 to 15 minutes on my future, like what I want to do for the future. I think that that's like a good breakdown. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, the goal should be that you, you can show as you're a great presenter and they can, if they remember, if they go back to the different candidates, they can remember, okay, that was the guy with the biomaterials and the sex stuff, you know, like you want to make a lasting impression, but I, the search committee and the department has your proposal with your letters and your CV in front of them. So mm -hmm. if you can make for a compelling story with your grant work, you should do it, of course. I don't think it's a requirement. Yeah. I think it's just, it's, it's important to like, like your department seminar should be like, here's the work that I did that will enable me to do my yeah. lab like this will enable me to launch my lab. 
So if it's just your postdoc research that enables you to launch your lab, then sure, that's fine. But like, I'm using also tools from grad school. So it's, it was important for me to kind of talk about that. Um, but you don't want it to be the focus because unless you're a grad student, then like your job talk will probably be like your thesis defense, right? Like, <laughs> so I think it's just very different for different people. You also don't want it to be just a literature review, just list all the papers and all the data. You, you want it to be a story that they can, that yeah. everyone in the audience can remember from the department head who is an organic chemist to the undergrad who is a pre-med, you know, depending on the department, but you, you want them to remember you in some of it, like, oh, that would be great to have this person in the department. That's sort of the impact. That's sort of what you're going for, I think. Yep. I think in general, it's just important to think logically about that. My postdoctoral work was very different than my grad work and my future of anything was not based on what I'd done in grad school. So there was no point in really incorporating that. So if it doesn't make sense to put it in, like, like I said, they have your CV. They can read about your publications there. You don't need to showcase that if you're not gonna use that down the line. Yep. Uh, and so I guess all y'all might have applied and had interviews during the whole COVID period. So did your interviews basically shift from being in person to online? I did not. And I did my second visit the week before everything shut down. And then all I did was oh, wow. So I was very lucky. <laughs> I, I had a few uh, on-site visits that ended up becoming virtual. Um, to be honest, like, I like them better. <laughs> like, so, okay. The virtual, it, the virtual. It, it was, so to be honest, it was towards the tail end of my interview circuit and I was getting exhausted. Like it's an exhausting process to travel weekly for interviews, get your suits clean, do all this laundry, blah, blah, blah. Like it just takes so much time. So I've heard of some candidates that like packed in interviews and did like two interviews a week. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just like, it's just, don't do that. Like, <laughs> like do one a week maximum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you you realize that you have a lot of the power in mm -hmm. like dictating when you want to interview. Um, it's to say, actually, I'm traveling that week because everyone knows what that means. Yeah. Like, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like I'm traveling. Oh yeah, I'm being interviewed, right? So it makes you yeah. look more attractive as a candidate. Um, so yeah, I I would usually like my my schedule was. I would purposefully travel on Wednesdays so that like Monday, Tuesday would be prep, travel Wednesday, um, interview Thursday, and then maybe like a half day interview Friday and then fly home that same Friday, right? Like don't take your weekends like to travel, like just say I'm flying out Friday night. And then that way you can just be home on Saturday and just like crash because <laughs> um, that, that's just how I like to do things. Um, I, like I didn't want like my business travel to interfere with my like my weekends, you know, because weekends were precious to recharge and like do laundry, <laughs> you know, and then like rinse and repeat. Um, so that's like I think that's like my biggest advice for those. But anyway, for COVID, I had two interviews that ended up moving completely remote, and that was really nice because you ended up just sitting on your computer. Like, sure, you got Zoom fatigue, but like. I, I just thought it was way easier because you didn't have to um, walk around the whole campus and those kind of things. But at the same time, there's benefits to seeing the campus, right? Like, fortunately, my last two interviews were institutions that I was like, well, like, it was nice to get offers, but it might not be my top choice, right? So um, it ended up making things a little easier. Um, actually, that's not true. My last interview was my second choice, which was really tough because I like ended up not going there. And it was, it would have been nice to see like the campus and see the labs and everything. Cause like, like to this day, I'm like, would that have impacted my decision? But probably not, <laughs> you know, like I keep telling myself that, but. Here's what I learned like very late in the process of like kicking myself when I doing this earlier. When you go out to dinner, someone at like the second to last interview suggested like, we can all get, how about we all get dessert to go? I'm like, okay. So then you sit in your hotel room with your dessert. That is amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I will say dinners were the hardest part for me. So like, so dinner, like it's at the end of a very long day and just me personally, like 
I'm, I'm very extroverted, but I also get physically just like I'm done, you know, like my batteries are just out. Um, so by the time dinner came along, like you still have to be this enthusiastic candidate that like wants to ask questions and things. So that was really challenging for me. And I had to draw and I feel like the dinners were not a really great reflection of who I am personally, like, <laughs> because you caught me at the end of a very exhausting day, whereas I, I like to think of myself as really fun during dinner. But it's just like, it, it was tough for me. But it's really just a matter of like trying to stay engaged and like, mm -hmm. it, it's an opportunity to meet new colleagues and try to like, just power through. It, 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 it's tough, but that's why I think I like the virtual visits best because at like 5 p.m. you could just sign off. <laughs> there was no dinner, right? So, so I don't know. It's, but the faculty dinners are nice. They want to treat you. They want to wine and dine you. And like, that's the other aspect. It's like, you want to let them do that and like feel, feel pampered, you know? So that's nice. Yeah. What, what, one fun thing that happened from actually at Georgetown at the so usually the job talk is on the second day I've noticed so the first day so the dinner you, I, I was still kind of nervous because I knew the job talk was coming up and this person on the on the search committee was trying to give me all this advice about the job talk at the dinner <laughs> and I was like you know what it's gonna be it, it'll happen tomorrow at nine it kind of is what it is now <laughs> so, and that was funny and then it, I got I got the job so yeah. But that was, I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is like, not helpful, but thanks for trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely stay the course. Don't, don't change your no. presentation like the night before, <laughs> but just. <don't. laughs> but, but what you should do at the end of the day, even if you're super exhausted, is write everything down that happened. Every comment, every person. Oh, comment, yes. Like everything. Like, this was I, weird. I'm going to make a note just because you will forget later. Yes, I kept and, a journal. And I have a thank you notes later and it also help to think okay. through if this place has any witnesses or things to follow up on or all of that. Yeah. So every like just a mental recap at the end of each day, no matter how tired you are. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you looked back at your journal, Esther? I looked back the other day. And I, I, like, I did just for no negotiation. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of crazy just watching all the highs and lows. It's like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and what, right. what talking about meals so oftentimes you will go to usually lunch with uh, students and I found that actually the weirdest meal because they know each other and you kind of want to avoid that they start talking to each other so you want to keep a conversation going with you so really have some questions in the back of your mind that you can ask them to get them talking for those kind of experiences you really want to be the PI in the room right like don't end up going back to being a grad student yeah. suddenly because you're around a bunch of grad students like don't do that like you need to be the pi in the room and like still like be personable but also be like you're, you're like offer seniority right <laughs> so, yeah. I think pay attention there too students can often be a bellwether of whether that's somewhere you actually want to be mm -hmm. or not so yes pay attention to what they're saying as well and look for you know either either you know Green lights or red flags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same with faculty. I, I was one person on a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I like asked him, okay, so you've been here for two years. How, how, how has that been? Usually my introduction question. And he's like, oh, terrible. And closed the door when we got into his office. I'm like, okay, that's the red flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe just exhausted, but still. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that goes in my journal. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, well, um, you know, it's starting to be, um, you know, getting a little late now. It's uh, 3.47. So I think I'd like, just like to kind of wrap this up. Um, so I guess my last remark and my last question for all of y'all is, you know, what is one piece of advice that you might have for those in the audience who are, you know, currently applying or thinking of an academic career? Piece of advice. Don't give up. Um, I think it's hard when you put all that work into that first, you know, set of documents and you send it off and you get nothing, um, or, or you get the, the, the phone interview and then you get nothing and you get nothing after that for a long time. I, I don't think that's uncommon to, mm -hmm. to get a first hit and then not get anything for a long time. Just keep revising and keep making things better. Um, I think that's, that's probably my advice, isn't that if things don't, Feel like they're coming up and that they're appearing 
keep looking at the job boards. New thing. I, I agree. I, I wouldn't. My advice would be like that goes back to the question of how many papers do you need to have, right? You have the papers you have, so you put your best foot forward and try. <laughs> Yeah. And it's usually it's about fit, which is like this weird description. So that means if you don't get the job that someone else does, it might it, it's not personal. It might be something totally out of your control. What happened? Yeah. I think my biggest piece of advice is to not do this on your own. Like find a network of postdoc friends and colleagues that you can trust to read your documents and give feedback you can trust to give practice chalk talks to like don't feel like you can you do this alone like i i, I think that that's the biggest piece of advice i could give and i see lots of candidates trying to do this on their own and like like trying to be secretive about what they do and i i just don't think that that's the right approach because it's just like you're standing alone on an island and you're not really getting any feedback and hey, maybe that works for you and maybe that's the way you work best but I kind of find the best way to stay motivated at the very least is like have a bunch of friends and kind of commiserate together. Um, that was hugely important for me. Cool. Well, thank you all very much for your time and all your advice today. Um, I would the audience please join me in a round of virtual applause uh, for our panelists. Uh, thank you all very much. Awesome. Um, so. So for those of you in the audience, I'm going to actually just launch a very short exit poll. I would really appreciate it if you could um, just fill it out as you are, you know, maybe filing away. We'd just like to, you know, get some feedback on how the event went and, and anything we can do better. Um, and also, very quickly here, just to plug the next seminar. Our next seminar will be coming up in December second uh, with uh, Dr. Bonnie from the Environmental Futures, and she's going to talk about. Uh, U.S. Mil militarization and indigenous poetic protests in the Pacific. And if you're interested in this, or if you're interested in presenting in the seminar, uh, please let me know, send me an email. Uh, here's my email address. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. See ya. Bye.